in the middle of uh, the de decade for the 2000s, so around about 2006, um, uh, we, our ideas came about that produced um, invisibility and cloaking, the idea that we could manipulate light in space to render objects invisible uh, by guiding light around, uh, around objects. A few years later, uh, 2010, um, again here at Imperial College, um, my group um, examined a possibility that was related to the idea of manipulating light in, in just space. And we started to incorporate the time dimension into our analysis of how to manipulate electromagnetic fields. So we have a, a very clear understanding of how to distort just space and how to uh, in, incorporate uh, or make a metamaterial that can make those uh, distortions a reality, such as an electromagnetic cloak. Our work um, expanded that to a more general transformation theory that incorporated not just space, but the time dimension as well. And so in, a, in, a, in, a, in an analogous fashion to distorting electro, electromagnetic fields or light around an object, we examined the possibility that we could distort light in space-time. It's a little bit harder to understand immediately what that might mean, what might a space-time cloak mean. And so I'd like to first of all say that what it, whereas in the terms of a spatial cloak we're hiding an object in space, when we're dealing with space-time, if we're hiding points in space-time, that is, that is the same as hiding events or happenings, a little like if I clap my hands, that in some sense that event is hidden from some observer. Um, maybe the observer just sees my hands like this all the time and misses out that little moment when the uh, clap occurs. Um, and so our work was directed towards the possibility of producing um, a cloak that um, could hide events. Um, and the kind of cartoon example I like to give that illustrates this is imagine that um, you have a, a, a bank with a safe and you've got some CCTV camera that's illuminating. Um, if we were able to make a space-time cloak, we would be able to manipulate the light so that uh, um, uh, there is a brief period of time for which no light actually uh, is, is illuminating the safe. And this allows a safe cracker to come in and steal all the cash, close the safe and run away, whilst the CCTV camera um, just sees the safe closed all the time. A, a remarkable um, possibility. And just to give a, a, a quite a, a good analogy as to how this works, imagine we've got cars uh, going down a highway at a constant rate, a stream of cars. Um, but we, um, we change the speed at which the, at which the cars are going so that at, some, at a particular um, set of cars start to move a bit quicker and some, and some of the cars behind move a little bit slower, so that kind of gap opens up. And this is the opportunity, the gap is the opportunity for something to occur in a cartoon way. We can imagine a chicken crossing the road. And then afterwards, those cars close up so that that flow is, is um, may, uh, recovered, so that someone downstream never actually knows that the chicken crossed the road. Of course, if the gap wasn't opened up, the chicken would get run over and we'd know about it uh, uh, down, downstream. But this idea of manipulating the flow of light such that a gap can be opened up dynamically is the basic idea of the so-called space-time cloak. Just as the 
invisibility cloak that uh, was examined, uh, was proposed in 2006, exploited um, Maxwell's equations and the properties of Maxwell's equations to deduce what kind of metamaterial would be necessary to produce a, a cloak. So too on the, in the space-time arena, um, it was Maxwell's equations now in the full space-time um, context um, where we examined how the equations transform in space and time that told us the, 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 the recipe for making a metamaterial that could produce um, a space-time cloak. Um, one thing to emphasize uh, about the, the theory that goes, goes into this, uh, Maxwell's theory, is that Maxwell's theory is a dynamic theory. It's, it's, it, it fundamentally relates um, quantities that are evolving in space and time. So in some sense, the space-time transformation optics is the, is the most complete description of transformation optics that, uh, that we have. But it meant that when you apply that theoretical recipe to produce a, uh, a cloak or a space-time cloak, it means that it, 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 it imposes even more extreme technological challenges to actually make uh, such a device than did the original um, spatial cloak. It meant that we had to manipulate the properties of the material, not just in space, but also in time. Um, in fact, um, our own ideas, uh, we're theorists, so we just put out possible ideas. Our own initial proposals in our early papers considered the possibility that the, this kind of dynamic changing of the material could occur um, to some extent in an optical fiber. Um, and again, at the time when we were asked about these things in uh, 2010, when our uh, pa papers were first uh, published, um, we speculated that it would be many decades before any of these ideas could be turned into reality. In fact, um, a group at uh, Cornell University um, took the, taking inspiration from the idea of producing a space-time cloak, although apply, um, applying the concept in a, a more experimentally accessible way, were able to produce a tabletop demonstration of the idea of cloaking an event um, just a few months after our our first publication, so another remarkable um, instance of the translation from concept to, re to reality. Um, it wasn't very, it didn't actually hide very much time. It, it, it hid um, that the Cornell experiment hid uh, 12 picoseconds. That's 12 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, seconds, so not really enough to um, uh, for a bank heist, <laughs> but, so, but nevertheless a, a very interesting um, uh, a demonstration of the concept. And that has since been improved by the possibility of uh, uh, replicating a cloak not just once, but many, many times in rapid succession. That was demonstrated by a group at uh, Purdue University a couple of years afterwards. So in terms of uh, uh, where this has gone over the last few years, the Purdue experiment was, the, 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 in a sense, the best that has been produced in a, a major experimental setting. So they were able to not, not just produce one cloak, but uh, several cloaks in rapid succession at several gigahertz uh, rates. Um, the, in, a, in, a, in a sense, the move towards making the cloak, a temporal cloak, longer is of less interest than keeping the timescales short and being able to reproduce the cloak rapidly. Because when we, what we would like to do is to manipulate signals at, in ever faster rates along the internet and so forth with a very large uh, bandwidth. Um, uh, but. Um, and so really the, um, the, the experiments that use very rapid uh, timescales are, uh, are, are of most interest and uh, um, continue to set uh, considerable challenges. Um, but in terms of where this might be taking us, it, 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 it introduces a, another paradigm for um, optical processing 
one that allows us to have, let us say, two or more channels operating where we can interrupt one channel and process on another channel and then reconstitute the channel that has been interrupted as if it, so that the external observer only ever sees a continuous stream. So for example, a clock, a clock signal can be expanded up, allow us to process during the gap on some other um, priority channel and then that signal can be uh, reconstituted. And then the external, as far as the external circuit is concerned, that um, uh, priority channel has been processed instantaneously. So it's a kind of interrupt without interrupt uh, facility to give a, an analogy. It's as if I'm on a Skype call and, and my wife uh, calls on the telephone. It's as if I can take the telephone call and my, my colleague on the Skype call is never aware that the interruption has taken place. But scaling that down to the micro nano level is, is what would inip, uh, potentially uh, allow processing systems to, to occur more rapidly. And I think that's quite exciting. So um, just as with the, uh, with the spatial cloaking, I think the technological penetration of, in fact, all cloaking ideas, spatial and temporal cloaking, are likely to be in systems uh, that, are, that the end user is not necessarily going to be aware of immediately. And so in the case of temporal cloaking, um, it will allow us to um, have algorithms and processes that can be um, be carried out simultaneously um, without um, the parts of the algorithm being aware of each other. So in, in, in some sense, the um, processing can occur in parallel and therefore quicker. So with the idea of temporal cloaking, we have a, a possible functionality where we can interrupt signals and process other signals. And this is um, an example where the technological penetration is uh, of uh, transformation optics and cloaking is likely to be at a level that the end user is not necessarily going to be immediately aware of. It might make your mobile phone work a little bit faster due to the ability to process signals in different ways, but you won't necessarily be aware of the uh, immediate, uh, uh, of, of what the details of that uh, technology are. So I, I think that uh, it's exciting that we're able to, to, to do these things and we're able to demonstrate them in experiments, but the ultimate, uh, but, but I see for the immediate future, I see the technological impact as being something that um, uh, as end users, we're not necessarily going to be immediately uh, aware of, but it's, um, uh, it, it, in these cases, it, it will hopefully make our, our, um, our devices work better, our lives better, um, as well as some of these uh, uh, dark or nefarious ideas that uh, I hope they will never be useful.